and, but they, you know, he's how is like the Pope and, and, and Jim is the Monsignor, so we, we all have a pecking order we have to go through. I take a few minutes to introduce Rick Menner. I work for Rick at the University of Cincinnati. To come up and say a few words. Rick Menner's the head football coach at the University of Cincinnati. So Don Coriel's going around the table saying, so so is going to cut such a position, this is a position, this is a position. Well, after all the positions were used up, Jim's sitting there and says, Coach, what am I going to coach? He says, you're going to be your offensive line coach. The greatest, probably the greatest move that guy ever made was making Jim the offensive line coach. The greatest thing he ever accepted is he's been a line coach in this league for 23 years. One of the great respective guys in the profession, Jim Hannafin. Same thing would hold true 
if we were running this versus the under. So we'll start with the onside tackle and tight end. And I think right here is something that we do or have done in Washington Redskins over the years that maybe is a little bit, a little bit different than what a lot, a lot of other folks do. And that we're going to gap step, and believe me, we work on this, just taking a gap step, a gap step by that onside tackle. One short jab step to the inside, and the second step, the second step has to be upfield. It has to be upfield. I cannot, I cannot take that second step and bring it inside. If I do that, then my shoulders are starting to turn. I'm presenting a bad, a bad target here for my tight end. So that second step is one of one, and then the second one upfield. Now the term that we use is give that tight end body presence. Give him body presence. Don't leave him. Stay hugged right up into here. Now obviously he's got inside responsibility, so he has to look at that Mac linebacker in the event that that Mac linebacker is going to fire, so he can pick him off. But he's going to hang right in here. That tight end is going to gap step. And he's upfield and into that defensive end. Now, is that defensive end, obviously, if the defensive end crosses the tackle's face, he's going to take him and take him down and through the area. If the tight end, as he feels as he's into that end and that end's working out to him, he's going to stay into that. The tackle has off linebacker responsibility. He has the off linebacker responsibility. We know where that guy wants to hit it. He wants to hit it in that strong A gap. So we're going to either get a fire by that back or we're going to get that weak side <coughs> inside linebacker scraping hard and trying to hit that strong A gap. This tackle, we want him to hang with that tight end as long as possible till these people show, to have patience, to have patience. Now we're not asking for a double team. And we've all gone through uh, the years of, hey, okay, now you gotta have a double team and you gotta do this and you gotta do that. And in most cases, hey, it never really worked. It never really worked. I think the key for us when we faced a bubble type defense over here was the one, two steps, that gap, the second step upfield, the body presence, the body presence. And we would talk a great deal about that body presence. Say, hey, you're not giving them enough. You gotta give them more. And obviously throughout practice and drills and so forth, all the repetition that you need is the fact of firing this guy, making sure that he's getting that, that he's very, very alert. I don't care how many times you've run it, how many uh, looks they've had. At some point in the season, I've had some uh, great tackles play for me at, at the Redskins and uh, Jim Lachey, Joe Jacoby, those guys. Hey, every once in a while, come off the field and, and I'd be all over their ass going, God damn it, the son of a bitch came through there. No, he didn't. No, he didn't, coach. I swear to God, Jim, the guy didn't come. I said, honest to God, believe me, he did. Now, would you please don't let it happen the next time. But even, even great ones like those two fellows, hey, every once in a while, they're not going to be alert enough to keep their eyes focused on that inside linebacker. So you need to have to, you've got to work it, you've got to work it, you've got to work it. You've got to keep on giving them that look all the time throughout your, whether you're inside run periods, your nine on sevens, and certainly in the team. Okay, now, we talked about this. Obviously here, we're gap stepping, we're stepping with the near foot, and we're coming up field, and it all depends now on that nose tackle, whether he's an offset nose, he's shaded off here, or if he's a nose tackle in the old 5-2 uh, look where he's playing it pretty even, but we have got to make a determination now how we're going to block that guy depending on the style of play that individual is using. Is he a uh, passive type guy? Is he a reader? Is he a guy that likes to, to uh, uh, read it out and come across that on, on guard's face and scrape off 
Is he a penetrator? Is he an aggressive penetrator? So our hat placement is going to be dependent upon this, how, how this man plays. To start a game off and we don't really know how the guy is, we're going to put the hat in front. We're going to put the hat in front. We're going to eliminate the penetration to begin with. And then we're going to work from there. Then we're going to say, hey, if he's not a penetrator, if he's now starting to work out of there, now we're going to start playing it more for the rib cage, for the near hip, and so forth as far as his target. Okay, center. A quick stab, and I mean a real quick stab. And again, his, his angle back will be dependent again, game plan wise, how this guy plays. Is he a penetrator? Is he a guy that's going to kick down into a four eye or even further down into the gap? Or even so, is he a guy that's going to try to go back Doris and come across the face? Depending on that, but we're not going to hang around very long with that nose. I mean, it's just a quick stab and, and now I'm back out of there and I may be going for a cut on that defensive end, depending on how he is. Okay, now, we're at a few years ago, like everybody else, we were pulling both the guard and the tackle. And obviously, it was very, very nice years ago when we first started running it because this stub or Sam linebacker, whatever you want to call him, would open up the, the door here for us and that guard would come gaining ground and kick out and our tackle would lead up through the hole. And over the years, we'd make all kinds of money going up through here and it'd be some giant caverns. Now, obviously the defense caught, caught up with it. They'd start bringing this guy down hard and you know, wrong shouldering it. And then like everybody else, we had to adjust. We had to now make a, a decision here how we were gonna handle this scenario. And on several of the cases, what we would do to eliminate this problem, first of all, we would be stubborn like all of us. You know, we, we'd go, hey, they can't do that to us. Guard, the guards didn't particularly appreciate it. That's why a few of them, uh, Russ Grimm, was, he, he tells me he was 6'4", and now he's about 5'11". But he's like those old fullbacks in the ISO play of years ago. The, the, we would be stubborn like all of us, and we would say, hey, you got to root him out. Don't you log his ass in get up inside and kick his butt out of there. And tackle, you got to read it and power it through there. Well, eventually we finally realized that, hey, that wasn't working too damn well. And we were playing, I can still think back to a very strong <clears throat> New York Giant defense. And, uh, I mean, they had all, they had the guys that, if you wanted to play the 3-4-5-2, the, uh, they had them. I mean, they had some tough fellows right here. They could play that two gap and I mean knock your butts off. They had big strong inside linebackers and of course they had the great one sitting over here. Hey, 56. Jim, Jim, can you move that up on the screen? I'm sorry. Which way is this going? Well, hang on. There's no... Uh, no. Well, you wrote on top of the screen. <laughs> what? Why would you do that? You're going to use these blank sheets. Well, God you. dang it, I usually have secretaries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to train you. Okay. There you go. Now, wait a minute. Will I, will I do it? Yeah, you can just write anywhere you want on that screen. Okay. Right up on the top. All right. Hey, I'll keep this here, just in case. Stay right here, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> But a variation that we started doing against the Giants because of Banks and Taylor and about the wrong shouldering technique that they were using and forcing us to take it outside is that we would have, and we were playing them in a, in a tough, a very critical ball game a few years ago, and I can still remember Banks coming down hard and seeing this guard who would just pass him by, just go right by him and up fields and pick up the scraping inside linebacker. We still were using the same techniques that I talked about right here. We were coming down here, we were coming back fast, back here, 
the tackle, the backside tackle would pull and he would, and it was amazing to us how clean it was, how he was able to pick up uh, uh, Carl Banks and or over on the other side, uh, Taylor. And in both cases, and we went up and down the field on, on both of these guys the first time out of this, I think it was like a plus 25 yard gain. I mean, we hit that soft spot right out in here and, uh, and it was a thing of beauty. Now, the next thing that we would do, and probably even simpler than this, was that we would simply know that, hey, they worked all week about how they were going to close that down and how they were going to wrong shoulder it and so forth. Well, we would take a, our second tight end, and we'd be in a, in a too tight, say, package, a too tight package, and we were going to hold off by either bringing a wide receiver back over to hold off on the backside here, and now what we would do, we would just call load, load, 60 counter tray. And now we we're going to load it up, and now we're going to block this guy and take it out one more, one more gap. And that was very effective for us. And all we would tell that guard now, all I would tell that guard, hey, look, at, something's going to be coming off that edge, it's going to be coming damn quick, and be prepared for that safety type to be coming to uh, cut you down right now. So be, be on the alert. We don't know where he's going to be coming from, but be looking for something fast right off this edge here. Now we got the kick out on that. We'd get the good blocks into here, and we'd still get that tackle up to <coughs> kick off that onside linebacker. Those are a couple of things that we would do with that 3-4. Now, what happened, though, with the counter game, and we were probably more persistent, more persistent on on uh, the counter than uh, of staying with it than maybe anybody else. And that it was our bread and butter play, our bread and butter play. Our guys believed in it. We thought we could run it, and they did. They thought they could run it on anybody. And so, hey, it was always in the game plan. So it was really difficult for us to finally say and come into a game plan, come in Wednesday morning and Joe Gibbs stand up there in front of the team and, and in front of the offensive team and say, okay, game plan wise now, uh, here's what we're going to do. And hey, the counter wasn't in the game plan. And the guys would kind of go, you know, what? we can do that, we can run that. But that was not the case. Defensively, they could shut it down. And and a couple, of, a couple of things, and a bunch of us last night were talking about it, but, but a couple of things that can certainly do it to you was the games, the stunts, particularly on the back side. Front side, just as, just as Babbitt had to say, a tackle in game, an in tackle game, whether it was front side or back side, these things really caused some damn problems out of just your base 4-3 look. And you had, you had a heck of a tough time making the darn thing go. So once we started seeing teams either working the, the stunts backside on us or front side, hey, we finally said, hey, forget it. We can't. We've got to go something else. We've got to do something else. The other thing, and something that, that we all uh, certainly see today, and it certainly isn't anything new, and I kind of laugh about this. I think back to the early 70s in the National Football League and the prevailing defense at that time. Was the under defense and the over, the under and the over. That was back in the in the late 60s, early 70s. And now all of a sudden, uh, in the last three, four years, hey, it's come back in. And, and I look at college film, and the college film, hey, it's the under and the over. And we will, you know, now no longer do you see the 3-4, the 5-2, whatever. That used to be number one thing. And when uh, fellows came in out of college football, Chuck Fairbanks, guys like that, and they came in, and they came in with the idea of the 3-4 and the uh, – unbelievable amount of really good linebackers available to play the game and not very damn many good defensive linemen, the 3-4 was there. 
in the NFL. And of course, LT, number 56, was probably undoubtedly a big time influence also. Now, <clears throat> with that under defense, the problem that we got into with the counter was right there. That three technique on the back side. That backside three technique, no matter how in the hell we tried to do it, if this guy really was aggressive and really got off, we could not get that tackle past him. We could not get that tackle past him. And like everybody else, we would, at some point in the year, we would have our second tight end, our fullback type personnel, and we would substitute that that individual for that backside tackle, and we'd pull him. The only problem was, and I'm sure you probably have uh, hit on this too, is the fact that that individual, you know, when we'd get to it, we'd get to it about halfway through the season. So we didn't have a lot of confidence in the individual doing it. The individual didn't have a lot of confidence in himself doing it. And so it was kind of a hunt and peck type of deal and, and nobody with a lot of a lot of confidence now in that play. So like a lot of people from the get-go in training camp we would say hey we've got it we've got to start training these guys right now be able to pull like our tackles and to make the adjustments like our tackles will make. So we would do that. Again though this guy was a major problem. A major problem. And we thought we solved it with, and to a degree we have solved it with the, the uh, backside or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, even here out of the eye. And coming back, let him be the trapper and let this guy be the second guy coming through. And in, in most cases, and this is how we will run it this in uh, next season, and the seasons in the last couple of years where we're not even thinking about bringing that tackle anymore. He's always, always somebody else. It's always somebody else. It's a second type tight end. It's a fullback type guy, so on and so forth, rather than the tackle. Now, if we're working against this front, that under front, again, we're working that first and second step up field, working body presence on this and being prepared to pick off that inside linebacker, not taking off knowing full well that this backside guy is going to again try to hit that gap, try to hit that gap. This guy being an offset guy, we've got to say a two-foot split here, a two-foot split. We're going to step with that inside foot and explode on him. And again, we're not going to, I'm not going to tell that guy, hey, put the hat in front or put the hat up field. I'm not going to go to a point like uh, Jim McNally spoke last night to a group of us, and I'm not going to repeat the statement that he made, but uh, basically what he stated was, well, I'll, I'll suck whoever, whatever, if you could tell me how to make a down block. Because when I put my hat in front, the guy goes there. When I put my hat up field, the guy goes here. So. Uh, in answer to Coach McCow McNally's request, <laughs> I'm going to tell him how to do it. <laughs> and if you're in the room, Mr. McNally, I'd like to have you come up here. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> but what we're going to do, what we're going to do is aim our hat, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to aim our hat at that near hip. And we're going to adjust off that. If I aim the hat at the near hip and he's penetrating, I'm going to get a pretty damn good shot on him. I should be able to close that penetration off sufficiently. If I aim that hat at that near hip and, and hey, he's kind of soft and he's starting to read, I can get my second step upfield and explode on him upfield and work the pin in that fashion. Okay, Jimmy? Or I'll see you afterwards. <laughs> okay. Now, here, again, we're not messing around with, with uh, that nose tackle at all. Our center is coming back flat right now. He's coming back right now. 
he's expecting either that that uh, defensive tackle is going to be in a hard charge straight up field in a penetrating move or that he's coming down hard inside. So he's coming over here and exploding low and hard backside for this individual. Okay? The tackle is stepping hard down inside in a flat gap step and he's coming out and slamming, slamming that three technique and coming off late for that defensive end. Coming off late for that defensive end. Now, one of the other things that we liked about this is the fact with using another guy is the fact that we didn't have to get into like we all have had to in one back offenses and certainly when we got to the three wide package and we wanted to run the counter where we had to bring a wide out and eventually in motion get that guy over the hip of that tackle, that backside tackle to secure that backside. And obviously defenses would uh, prey upon that that you're constantly trying to figure out, okay, let's use this type of motion, a different type of personnel. And the problem we all got into there is that we'd have maybe one guy in the wide receiver group that could do it, was willing to do it. Some of them would go, are you kidding me? You're going to have my ass come on in there and try to hold off that defensive end? <clears throat> Give me a break. You know, uh -uh, I'm not going to do it. So usually it would be with one guy, and unfortunately that guy would get hurt at some point in the year, and hey, there goes that problem. You know, there, there's, now you have a real hang -up. But by training these other guys, fullback types or second tight ends and so forth from day one in training camp to be the, the guy coming up through there helped immeasurably. Now, the other front that we see so much, and I, and I know that the college guys that you do too, is the overlook. And again, and I'm just going to draw it up out of the eye, that in the over, with that overlook, and if we're sitting here in the eye, there's a good chance they're going to boss those linebackers real good, and they're going to, they're going to be sitting And they'll probably put that Mac linebacker stack or even cheat it a little bit more in that strong A gap. And they've got the stub linebacker somewhere in this area. Okay, now, with the counter game, they've kind of helped us out here in truth. Now, we're going to want to work back over here into this area also. But let's say we're going to be persistent and we're going to run that counter versus this look into that, into that. We're going to make a call, a call telling, telling our folks here, however, how we want to block this. And all is dependent on this guy right here. Where in the hell is he? If he's off the ball, then what we want to get is a double team here. We want to get the double team here. He's now going to stay on that nose tackle. He's going to secure that backside. He's got from here all the way down to that nose, he's got to take care of that area for us. He can't let that will linebacker dog from that area and hit it down into here. He can't let that end kick it down and come down through there and penetrate inside. So this backside tackle has got a job of that whole entire area back in there. But the good thing about it that I really love is the fact that now we get to double team. Now we get to double team. Now we are able to really supply some power into the play. Now, the biggest problem, obviously, is right there. We know it, you guys know it, and certainly the defense knows it. That's why they like to play it. Put a mismatch over there. Put a, a big defensive end on top of your tight end. Hopefully, you have a tight end that can and or will block. But what we ask of that tight end, in truth, we're not asking a great deal of the guy. We're not asking him to be a road grader. We're not asking him to take that man off the ball. We're not asking him to do those things. No. 
That would be foolish. We're saying to that guy, excuse me, give us a stalemate. Give us a stalemate. Believe me, I don't know how many cotton picking times during games uh, when the fellows would be up, get to the sideline, and after I'd be talking to my own fellows, I'd go to that tight end. And I said, please, just give me six more inches, six more, six more inches, just a little bit more, uh, just a tad more, and that baby is going to go like the sun again. That's all we need. And we constantly stress that to those tight ends, to our tight ends of today. Uh, just, hey, it's not a big time block, but you've got to get into that son of a gun. You've got to give us just a, a tad. Now, it's a hell of a lot better if this guy is going to be active and if he's really hauling ass down inside on a pinch move or he's in a, uh, in a seven inside there or he's wanting to work little games and, and take the outside, things like that. They would love it. Now, what we do do to help, to help out is to, if we know that this is the look that we're going to get, is that we can go ahead and set him up over here and we'll bring him in motion over here and it's the same deal. It's the same deal. We're going to have him get to here front up on that guy. Now we've got enough other stuff that we're going to do off this look that will make that end have to be concerned about what's going to take place. Is he going to get trapped from inside out? Whatever. Other, th other things happening to him. So this will help that tight end. This will help that tight end. Well, most of the time, or uh, a great deal of the time, we're going to want to put this guy right on that line and get that stalemate, get off, take a quick gap step to protect that inside, a quick gap step, then front up on the guy, and then just stalemate. Now, one thing that does help that tight end's block is that the guard is pulling, and in pulling, the tight end hears me tell the guard this, that I said, hey, I want you to come, you're coming right off that double team spike, and I want you to get going in a north-south direction, and I want you to hit the first thing you see. And I said, hey, if that guy's slipping off that tight end spot, splatter his ass. Well, I'll guarantee you, the tight ends hear that, and they know that a 315 pound or a 330 pound guy is coming hauling ass over there and there's a good chance that if I screw this thing up he may well be splattering my ass and it's a great motivation it's a great motivation for that tight end because I mean, he's going to really try his ass off and every once in a while in practice or in a game hey, he is going to get his bell rung by that off guard coming up through there because I tell the off guard hey look we can't have any indecision. Don't screw up the running back by you uh, bouncing around when you get to that area. If there's any daylight there, you take that damn thing up through there. And you hit the first color. You hit the first color. I can think back a few years ago to uh, a great football player, Joe Jacoby, uh, one of the all-time guys to ever coach. I mean, he's, he was a true pleasure to coach. And that the big guy, first of all, he was huge. Secondly, he was uh, immensely strong. And, but the thing about Jake was the fact that everything was here to him. It was all heart. All heart. And Jake had come off uh, a couple of times there where he had uh, knee injuries and so forth. And he had to go through rehab and so forth. And this one particular season, season of uh, 90, he had finally worked his way back and he was playing tackle, but I now had started working him at guard. And uh, uh, as he was working there inside at guard, golly, I was getting to the point where I was going to have, going to have maybe one of the most awesome guards in the world. And I can still remember uh, the unfortunate experience that John Offerdahl had. And John's an excellent football player, but my God, we uh, Dolphins came into town to play us. And here's Offerdahl playing that weak side inside linebacker in the 3-4. And I decided that week, hey, I'm going to start Jake at left guard. Well, Jake's, you know, 6'8", 315, 320. Offerdahl's a 
you know, a big guy, you know, six one and a half, maybe 225, 230. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, it was kind of brutal to watch. I mean, hey, you know, we're running some zone plays, and Harry would come out of there, Jake would come out of there, he'd pick the poor bastard up, he'd have him up in the air. I mean, it wasn't even what you'd call pancakes, you know, it was flapjacks, I guess. You know. <laughs> but, but we're playing the Bears the next week, and he gets into the game. He didn't start the game, but now he's in the ball game, and we're start to run some counters. Well, he had always been that backside tackle pulling, and Russ Grimm was always the guy having to take on that first thing that he uh, showed up out there. Well, we ran a couple of counters, and where Jake was the off guard, and uh, all of a sudden the Bears called timeout. Jacoby comes running over to me on the sideline, and he goes, his eyes, his eyes are like this, they're like giant saucers. And he goes, he goes, Jesus Christ, Jim. He says, what do you do? He says, things really happen like a, a fancy shit when you're playing guard, don't they? Yeah. I said, yeah. I said, they sure as hell do. He says, what should I do? I said, hit the first thing you can see. Just hit it. And I mean, you know, a lot of times we get into talking about coaching, and I believe strongly in techniques and fundamentals. But a lot of the other times, I mean, hey, let's not go crazy, you know. Just go hit that faster and hit the first thing. You know, let's not get, you know, we go overboard about, well, now, you know, all this and that. But the, this factor here, and we talked, last night a group of us were talking about the double team. And when we get around to doing this, we used to, and we screwed ourselves over. At that point in time, we got a three technique on the outside, on that outside shoulder of us, and we would, because we were calling the counter, we would gap step that onside guard, and of course that onside tackle was gap step. And believe me, we were very, very, and we still are when we're running the counter, depending if, if it's, uh, you know, the onside tackle and he's got a bubble inside him, where we're going to gap step it, the tight end, he's going to gap step, and we really work a lot on just the fundamental footwork. A great deal of time spent on that. Our guys will gap step, gap step. They know what the hell we're talking about. But we really screwed ourselves over. Now we had to, and we still would, this day and age right now, if if uh, if we had if we had to face a team that's going to put that little linebacker on the line of scrimmage. So if he's on that line of scrimmage, now we're going to have to make a call, make a call and have that center come back and have the tackle staff and be ready to pick up the will if he does come. And that, obviously, now that necessitates us to do this. Now we'd rather not do that. We'd rather not do that. But the nice thing about it, defenses don't like to put that little linebacker on the line of scrimmage anymore either. They want to get his ass back into here so he can get his butt roaring on pursuit and so forth. So it is, it's worked out for us and then it gives us the opportunity to now to double over here and rather than have to angle everything back in such a way. But obviously that's what we would have to do once this guy gets to that line of scrimmage. We've now got to do this. Not that that can't be effective. It can be effective, but it's not as effective as that double team. Anytime I can get a double team, I'm going to take it. And that'll take us into the next into the next uh, run that we use, and we really use it now even more than the counter. And this is not the case. Not just the fact that. Uh, uh, Nora Turner, our head coach, is there, and we're working that his offense and so forth, because that offense really is kind of an offense of, of uh, well, it goes all the way back to a gentleman that uh, Bob Wiley spoke of, Don Coriel. And uh, really kind of Don's offense, I mean, the passing game uh, and the running game. Uh, it goes all the way to San Diego State and then to St. Louis and then back to San Diego with the Chargers, 
But then all of us kind of started floating out of there. You know, myself back to St. Louis, Joe, the, the Redskins, uh, Ernie Zampisi up to the Rams. Uh, Ernie, uh, then Dorf was with Ernie there. The Rams, bam, he goes to Dallas, not Norris, the, the Redskins. But terminology, a lot of the uh, various things that, that we do in the passing game, it all goes back to a guy that we affectionately call Daffy Duck. <laughs> And this guy is something special. Those of you that had an opportunity to play for him or to coach for him, and he's one of, uh, he's only one of them, only one guy like him. And uh, Bob was mentioning the fact uh, how it happened about me being the offensive line coach. I'm looking around and, hey, I can't understand. I'm, you know, I've already signed my contract. And, uh, but, hey, I want to be in San Diego State. Hey, they got a, it's a hell of a deal. They're kicking ass. I'm going, shit, man, this will be this is a lot more fun than, than going six and five or five and six and working your butts off. We're going to be where we're, we're the kingpins. Man. And uh, we're driving down the damn street, pick up some furniture. And I said, by the way, coach, exactly, uh, I said, what do you want me to coach? You know, we haven't gotten around to talking about this. He goes, all the fit, he had a list. He goes, all the fit, he needs to coach the offensive line. I'm going, Jesus. I said, I haven't done that. I said, Coach, I haven't done that since high school. He's all said, He said, You're a good coach. He said, You can do it. <laughs> I'm like, uh, You know, what are you going to say? No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, you go, uh, Yeah, you're right, Coach. Golly. You know, now I'll tell you this. The one thing that really helped me on it was number one, again, the camaraderie of the coaching profession. Hey, calling guys up. Say, Hey, what about this? You know, what about that? That. And, and the other thing that really helped me a great deal was the fact, hey, I coached the quarterbacks. I coached the wide receivers. I coached the running backs. I had done all that for, uh, through high school, junior college, and college. And, uh, and so when I started talking to the offensive line, I'd be talking and saying, hey, look, let me tell you, this is how this guy thinks. This running back, this is what he, how he's looking at this. Or this is the quarterback, and this is what he's doing, and his drop, and this is his read, and this is what you're going to have to think in terms, you're going to have to protect him in this fashion and for this amount of time. And uh, so I thought in, throughout that, that that really did help, help me, and it helped me help the guys. Now, going on to this, what I'd like to do uh, is talk a little bit about the power play and then come back and then show you some film. Show you some film of both the power play and the counter of last season. And this is, I haven't gone ahead and uh, just clipped out the good ones so you see nothing but just some real great ass kicking. You're going to see some bad plays just like you're going to see good plays. So I mean this is uh, film that, hey, I just finished showing it to my guy. And uh, so you'll see, and I'll talk about, hey, I didn't like what happened here. Here's what we had to do. You'll see the problems. But I want to get to the power play right now, what we call 60-70 power. And we started using it in a nickel, in a nickel uh, situation to begin with, where we wanted to get, say, six in the box. And the first time we ran it was really, uh, well, we really did it. Uh, they were giving us some over. The offset was weak. We were getting this type of a look. And we were getting under and over uh, nickel type deals, you know, 4-2 type of deals, but over and unders. And <clears throat> this is like back in about uh, 90 or 91, and we were still working out of and which we still will do, a three wide package, and we wanted to run something like the counter. But uh, we didn't want, we knew that we couldn't do that, so we said, well, let's just run power, and our power, our lead blocker really is going to be this guy, the tight end. And I talked about in the counter game what we wanted to get out of this individual. The same thing is true with the power. And power, we're just saying, hey, all we're going to do, we're going to work a double team here to the off linebacker, and we're going to take this guy and take him through and finish this guy off. We had 
again, that backside tackle had to take care of that that gap all the way down to the center. So that linebacker, defensive end. And now we we're going to, and his ball carrying path was the same, ball carrying path and footwork was the same as the count. The same as the count. He was just going to delay it. He was going to hit down downhill. He was going to delay it enough so that old guard had time to get clear the center quarterback area and get up and get going. We started using that like in 1990, just in a nickel. And then we went, well, wait a minute. It's so damn good for us in nickel. Why don't we use it all the time? So it became a play that we uh, incorporated into our overall, any package that we had, any package, whether it was too tight or what. But we were going to work, work that, uh, get this, and at times we would take the tight end and bring him over here and we would load it up so we'd get a double team on that end, get a double team on that end, we'd get a double team on that three technique, and now we had some real power going here, <coughs> some real power going here, and then bringing that old guard around. And he would hit first daylight he saw. Jim, would you the, call the double team technique on the three? No, I'm not going to tell you about that. The double team seems like it's a mystery. I can remember, uh, I'm only kidding Bob there, but I, I, I'm certainly going to talk about it, and I'll talk about it right now. The, I made the comment to you uh, a few minutes ago about, <clears throat> about the fact that what we would do a lot of the times when we were running that counter, and we would have this look that we would take a gap step. We would gap step it even, and this was true, even when we had that wheel line back off that line of scrimmage and we were going to double team, we'd take a gap step, take that head down in there, you know, gap step, get the head there, then come back upfield, give body presence, and so on and so forth, to your offensive tackle. And now we were going to work the double team that way. Well, it wasn't worth a pile of crap, to tell you the truth. Because there was never any, what we would do, the guard would get caught down in here, the tackle would come down, and he'd angle down in here, and he'd knock the living hell half the time out of the guard. And the guy that seemed to uh, benefit from their up with all those techniques was the three technique, you know? And I'd go, God, we're just knocking the living shit out of each other, but we're sure as hell not doing anything there. Now, and all of a sudden, it dawned on me, I went, my God, how bad, how I was taught back in the 40s of double team. Like uh, any guy my age, you probably, uh, some of you, there aren't very many of you in this room, unfortunately. I don't see too many of you guys. You guys are too goddamn young. But uh, played single wing football. And boy, in the single wing, what the goddamn thing you were going to do, you're going to learn how to block. And it was unfortunate because I was a tight end. I wanted to catch the ball. And I was scared to death all the time. The coach coming to me, which he would, and he'd go, uh, Jim, I think I might have to move you inside. You know, I go, oh, Jesus Christ, you know. You know, you go, oh, no, please no. But, but, the one thing you were going to do, you were going to learn how to double team. You were going to learn how to double team. So, in my mind, I went, that's where we're screwing this thing up, is that screw the gap step on the double team. Uh-uh, that's wrong. We're going to go back, and I can still remember, vividly remember the day we were on the field, and it was during the season, and it was like, it was like 90, uh, 90 or 91, and I said, hey, I said, guys, I'm going to show you how I want you to do this. And, and I said, this is a throwback, fellas. I said, this is how it used to be, and this is what we want to get. This is how, what we want to get accomplished. What we want to get accomplished is this. Basically, if you look at it, 
I said, hey, look, here are the two of us all. Now, it's going to help if I just have a two-foot split. I mean, if I have a three-foot split, I'm asking a hell of a lot. I'm asking too much. I can't get it. So I need a two-foot split. But if I'm, say, if I'm the right guard, can you guys see this here? Can you see it? <clears throat> okay, if I'm the right guard, let's take the center, the center here. Here's his three technique here. That right guard, let's say he's in a right stand. I want to step, my first step is going to be with that right foot, right at his crotch. Right straight down the middle of, of that individual. That's my, that's a short, power, jab step, whatever you want to call it. But it's with the onside foot. It's coming right at him. This step, his first step, let's say he's in a right stance or parallel stance, is going to be a gap step. So he's going to step with that left foot. And now his second step is going to be with his right foot. He's going to be there. And what I want, and how I diagrammed it to him and showed him, I want your butts to be like this. Your shoulders right dead even to get. I want you to be low. I want to get leverage. I want the two of you coming straight off into that defender. And I don't want you worrying about linebacker. Where is he? No. I want you to come off that ball and smoke that sucker back off that ball. Take him out of there. Believe me, if you'll do that, hey, we'll live with the linebacker. Let the gosh dang guy be free, uh, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, we want to get to the guy, but I'm selling a point. The point is that I want removal. And if we don't get removal at that at the first level, hey, we're we've had it. We're screwed. And you'll see on this film, you'll see us not get that a few times. And it screws us. <coughs> now, the key, the key is the footwork. The key is the footwork. Now you're going to see at times, particularly my uh, young offensive right guard, he would get too carried away and he'd smoke this guy. I mean, he would, but he'd come out here too much. Now he polarized the guy. So I was happy about that. But at the same time, even when he did that, I would be on his case saying, hey, you're, you're coming over there too much. You're, you're knocking off the tackle. But what you'll see, and I'm sure... I'm sure uh, all of us, believe me, and we were talking again last night about it, if that tackle comes down like that, 